Good afternoon and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California, the brand new Commonwealth Club of California. You, you can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. I'm Kishore Hari. I'm the director of the Bay Area Science Festival, which starts tomorrow. Uh, you can find programs at bayareascience.org. Our speaker today is... Walter Isaacson, biographer of genius. You probably know Walter from his myriad of books, his chronicling of Steve Jobs, Benjamin Franklin, Henry Kissinger. Uh, but I think Walter's impact far exceeds that. Uh, in a time when so many of us feel like we're living in echo chambers, Walter's work really resonates beyond that, bringing us closer together with his work at the Aspen Institute and even being called upon uh, by the government to help coordinate response to uh, the, the hurricanes. Uh, tonight, though, Walter here is, is here to discuss Leonardo da Vinci. I, I think Renaissance Man doesn't even begin to describe uh, da Vinci's contributions to the sciences, to the arts, uh, and to humanities. He's certainly unparalleled in all of history. Uh, before we jump into a, a conversation and your questions, Walter is going to do a short presentation about 30 minutes long uh, about Leonardo da Vinci. So please welcome to the stage, Walter Isaacson. Hey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's um, absolutely wonderful to be in my favorite city, San Francisco, and back at the Commonwealth Club, although I had to pause as I came in and the salt air was coming through and seeing the new building, and it's just great to be here. I've been on, if not this stage, at least previous stages of the Commonwealth Club, talking about all the really smart people I've written about, from Ben Franklin to Einstein to Jobs, but one of the things that occurred to me, since Leonardo da Vinci is so good at spotting patterns, I finally spotted it, is that there are a lot of smart people in this world. Uh, there are a dime a dozen, actually, and they don't usually amount to much. <laughs> what really matters is creative people, innovative people. And so in this book, I tried to explore what is creativity? How do we define it? How do we achieve it? And it really comes, I've discovered, from something that San Francisco and the Bay Area is so good at, which is people who mix and stand at the intersections of the arts and the sciences, who love both, in fact, realize that art is a science and science is an art, and don't make that distinction. I remember being in the city so often when Steve Jobs would do product presentations, and what, he would end with a slide that showed a street sign intersection, a street sign of the intersection of the arts and technology street. And he said, it's at that intersection that creativity occurs. And I realized that the ultimate symbol of that is Vitruvian Man, the guy standing there, akimbo, naked in the circle in the square. And the ultimate exemplar of that type of creativity, the greatest creative genius of all time, was Leonardo da Vinci. And having been fascinated with him my whole life, I wanted to do this book on him. Now, Leonardo was born in the tiny town of Vinci, hence the uh, name, and he had the great good fortune to be born out of wedlock. <laughs> that meant he didn't have to be a notary like his father, a grandfather, and great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather. And let me tell you, Leonardo would have been a really bad notary. Uh, he was always thinking out of the box. He was always leaving things slightly unfinished, not dotting every I and crossing every T. And secondly, he had the good fortune because he was not sent to school. He was not sent to one of the uh, classic schools or universities that were stuffing the heads of people in the 1450s with uh, the medieval scholasticism of the church. And instead, Leonardo, with a bit of a chip on his shoulder, called him a man without letters, meaning he hadn't been uh, formally educated and he had to be self-taught. He had to become what he called a disciple of experience, meaning whenever he heard anything, he said, how would we know that? How would we test it? We see the beginnings of the scientific method there. Somebody who says, whenever given received wisdom, I have to look it in the eye, 
I have to test it and be a disciple of experience and experiment. So in all the little streams around the town of Vinci, he's sort of studying flows of water, the birds in flight. And he asks himself during his wonder years the questions we all ask ourselves when we're young, like, why is the sky blue? We see this in his notebooks. I did this book based on the 7,000 or so pages of the notebook. Does a bird, when it takes off, raise its wings faster or lower its wings faster? How does a dragonfly wings alternate or not? All these things that we were curious about when we were kids, but we outgrew when we outgrew our wonder years. One, the first secret of Leonardo is stay curious. Stay relentlessly curious. Curiosity for its own sake. Because throughout his life, he's making lists in his notebooks of things he wants to discover and learn and teach himself that week and to observe. And they're always those wonderful, like, why do people yawn? How do they walk on ice in Flanders? All throughout his notebooks, he never outgrows the curiosity of his wonder years. His father, uh, who did help raise him, even though he's illegitimate, takes him to Florence in 1470 uh, or so. Leonardo's about age 12 when he goes, and I'll say this for this audience, and we may talk about it later, there is a real connection between the geographies of genius, places where suddenly, for multiple reasons, genius starts to occur. And Florence in 1470 is a little bit like the Bay Area in 1970, 500 years later. People with all sorts of diverse talents are coming in with a huge amounts of tolerance. And whether it's people like Steve Jobs who are into you know, electric Kool-Aid acid tests and hippies and free speech movement, but also into processors and microchips, they're all fall, uh, coming together. Likewise, in Florence back then, there's suddenly an outbreak of tolerance. Under the Medici, you have people coming in from the fall of Constantinople, bringing the algebra from the Arab world with them. You have people who are like jewelry makers suddenly becoming artists, and artists becoming architects, and cloth weavers deciding to become great silk designers, and that mix of different interests. And then there's a tolerance, because the kid at age 12 who arrives in Vinci is illegitimate, left-handed, gay, vegetarian, heretical. As Steve Jobs would say, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square hole, the ones who think different, the ones who question authority. Uh, we know what he looks like because he works for Verrocchio. His father gets him an apprenticeship in that shop where they're churning out Madonnas and statues and ornaments for parades and things like that. And one of the things they churn out is a statue of David that Verrocchio does on the far left. And you see another young apprentice in the shop is doing things like, I guess I can't point a pointer at that since it's a backlit screen. Um, there's Leonardo posing for the statue of David. So we know, as everybody said, his contemporaries, that he was well-built, well-proportioned, very strong, young, good-looking. And on the far right is something in the Adoration of the Magi, one of Leonardo's first paintings as a young uh, artist, in which the artist is, sort of puts himself, a portrait of himself, looking out of the frame. So we can see the curly hair, the jaw, the build, the beauty of Leonardo. One of the things Verrocchio's studio did was they were in charge of pageants and plays. One of the things I learned in the notebooks that surprised me was that was his main job, Leonardo, not necessarily being a painter at first, but helping put on plays, pageants, and public spectacles, which is how they amused themselves in the days before movies and the internet and television sets. And so these are, this is the one on this side of me, is the first drawing we really have of Leonardo that's considered a piece of art. But it wasn't done, I realize, as a piece of art. I'm looking at Verrocchio and others. They are doing these as the uh, costumes for the visit of the Duke of Milan to Florence, and they're in charge of the pageant. So you see the lion on the breast, the dragon's wings, the fantasy mixing with art 
and good observation as Leonardo does pageants and plays. Even the great helicopter, which everybody says, oh, Leonardo invented the helicopter. This begins in a notebook page as sketches for a play where the angels have to come down from the rafters. It was originally intended not to transport people, but to transport their imaginations. And so the cool thing about Leonardo, as you'll see over and over again, is that he blends and blurs the distinction between the fantasy of the stage and the reality. Soon, after a while, he's not only doing helicopters for the stage, but saying, why don't we invent real flying machines? He also is studying the patterns of nature, and when Verrocchio does the baptism of Christ, he gets Leonardo to paint the angel on the far left in the background river. Once again, we see the rivers and his absolute feel for the pattern of nature of rippling waters and how it goes past the ankles of Christ does it scientifically right. But also the angel that he does on the far left has inner emotion to it, something that you didn't see yet in Renaissance paintings. That angel is actually has complex emotions on her face. Uh, he's turning, he has just landed. The angel next to him that Verrocchio does, about the only emotion on the face is how did I get next to this amazing angel? <laughs> the legend, which perhaps is true from a contemporary, is that when Verrocchio sees the angel, he throws down his brush and says, I'll never paint again, and just leaves it to Leonardo to do the painting in the studio. Leonardo starts doing portraits. This is his first portrait. Once again, we see the connection of humans to nature, the river swirling down as it did in the baptism of Christ, coming almost into the veins of the human. Ginevra da Benci, this is the first portrait. It is, like the Mona Lisa, a three-quarter profile of a cloth merchant, middle class cloth merchant's wife. It is clearly not the Mona Lisa, but it's also clearly the painting of the young person who would eventually paint the Mona Lisa. It took years of being involved in science and math and anatomy and all sorts of geology and also spirituality of how we fit into this universe for the painter of this to become the painter of the Mona Lisa. Other people have written about Leonardo say things like, uh, it's a shame he wasted so much time on science and engineering and anatomy studies. He could have spent it more usefully finishing his paintings for that, I say look at Ginevra da Benci, then look at the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa answers that criticism with her smile. Uh, he does uh, paintings that are all swirls. This is Adoration of the Magi. I mentioned it only as part of the biography because now he's getting a little bit older. He has his own studio, but he's not finishing his commissions. If he can't get it exactly right, if he can't get the narrative right, the second king handing the uh, gift, it's swirling around, every emotion on the face of one person affecting the next person. Very complicated, he just puts it aside. As he puts aside St. Jerome in the wilderness, doesn't finish that commission. One of the things I discovered though is sometimes he puts them aside not to give up, but saying, I will get better, I will make this perfect someday. For example, here in St. Jerome in the wilderness, he has the neck muscles exactly right. Now this is unusual because at the time, neither he nor anybody knew that there were two neck muscles like that. In fact, in a preparatory drawing, we see him doing it wrong with one neck muscle. So why is it right here in this early painting? It's because 25 years later, he starts doing his anatomy and he realizes, as you can see from that anatomy sketch, how the neck muscle works and he goes back to the painting he left aside 25 years ago, left in Florence, and if you look at it with a multispectral analysis, you see he overpainted what he originally done to get the neck muscles right. And so in his notebooks, we see the fascination of him dancing all across nature, the craggy old warrior-like, but the tree that grows into the torso of the, of the warrior, showing branching, the scientific Leonardo's theory of branching, which is that when branches come off a trunk, the combined area of each of the branches equals the combined area of the trunk. He discovers that that's same with anatomy, and so he shows just his mind kind of doodling around 
the tree and the arteries connecting. The swirls and curls in the upper left of water and air becoming curls of hair, the curls he loves so much. And then the scientific problem of squaring the circle, which he becomes obsessed with, making a square the exact same size as a circle using only a ruler and a protractor, which is hard to do since pi is an irrational number. But my favorite thing on this particular notebook page, and I'm just showing you that every page is crammed with things, this is now when he's reaching 30, and in the bottom there is a recipe for making boiling nuts and oil and making blonde hair dye. <laughs> he's, go he's worried about going gray. He's an awesomely good-looking dude with curly hair, blonde hair, very vain about his appearance, wearing pink and purple robes all the time, very buff, exercises a lot, and now figuring out blonde hair dye. As I said, he was gay, and uh, most people hadn't written about this much. I think it was just part of who he was. He was so perfectly comfortable with it. His boyfriend, uh, his first major boyfriend is named Salai. We um, see in, in all sorts of his drawings, the curly hair, as one of the contemporaries says, of Salai uh, that Leonardo much adored, uh, but becomes a very long-term companion of his, uh, and we'll see him throughout the notebooks. But at this point, as I say, when he reaches 30, there's lots of paintings he didn't finish, some of which his father had notarized the contracts for. Those of you who have 20-something kids where you've helped them get a commission and they don't finish it, uh, we all know that feeling, and um, we can tell maybe Papa da Vinci was not all that happy, so Leonardo decides to leave Florence. He goes as part of a cultural delegation to Milan. Uh, the Medici got their influence not through an army, which they hardly had, but through sending musicians, playwrights, painters, architects around Italy. He goes as a musician, Leonardo, because he's invented two types of musical instruments, an arm lyre and others. Uh, but he writes the most amazing job application letter when he gets there because he wants to stay in Milan. And he writes to the Duke of Milan an 11-paragraph job application. The first 10 paragraphs are all about his engineering skills. I can build great public buildings. I can make weapons of war. I can divert the course of rivers. I know how to do great machinery. It's only in the 11th paragraph does he add, I can also paint. And of course he could, but he always thought himself as a painter and as an engineer. One of the first things they have him do, the Duke of Milan, is the Milan Cathedral didn't have a tiburio. That's that little pointed tower there, a lantern tower. And Leonardo and some of his friends collaboratively, we forget that they work together collaboratively, have been asked to be a part of a group that will put the lantern tower up. Leonardo believed, like Steve Jobs, that um, simplicity was the ultimate in beauty and sophistication. Those of you who have seen this cathedral or see it in my book or see it here, no, it's not simple. In fact, it's an absolute ugly Gothic monstrosity of a building, just the type Leonardo would hate. And he and his friends design a sort of square lantern tower with a circle in it that's absolutely simple and beautiful. And as you can tell, they don't build it. Uh, the Milan authorities want a Gothic monstrosity. But by doing so, Leonardo becomes friends with a group of people, most notably Donato Bramante, the one sort of balding uh, on the right of that picture, uh, who's an architect and artist. And he does this painting, and it's him with his friend Leonardo. Once again, we saw him as a youth. We can see him still with the golden curly hair, the, uh, they put well-proportioned body, strong jaw, and of course he's wearing his purple and pink, he always wore purple and pink tunics that were short, uh, made him a bit of a dandy, and in front of him is one of his notebooks, is that we're absolutely sure that's Leonardo, because it's done in mirror script. Uh, Leonardo being left-handed goes from the left-hand side of the, I mean, yeah, goes from the right-hand side of the page to the left, the other way than we usually write. And that's a mirror script notebook. And what they decide to do is they want to build churches right. Because spiritually, Leonardo believes that the proportions of a church 
to be connected to the proportions of a human. He's always wondering how do humans connect with nature and how do humans connect with nature and the spirit. And so they have simple churches. These are Leonardo's drawings, but Bermonti and Francesco Giorgio, their friend, they all do the same with sort of a Greek cross design. And the square and the circle, Leonardo's still trying to do the square and the circle. And they know Vitruvius, the ancient Roman architect whose book has been rediscovered and talks about how the proportions of a man should reflect the proportions of a church. Leonardo does 230 measurements of the proportions of a human to get everything from the chin to the lips to all exactly right. And he's still trying to square the circle. He's, I mean, there's, he's a geeking out. I mean, going down rabbit holes, page after page of different ways to create crescents within circles to get the area exactly right. And they go to Pavia for a couple of reasons. One is they're going to help build a church of the type that they like. This is it, a simple church. Secondly, the great manuscript of Vitruvius, the ancient Roman architect, had just been rediscovered. And the best copy of it was in the library of the castle in Pavia. So it's near Milan. They spend uh, about two weeks there in July of 1492 uh, working on this notebook and deciding they have to illustrate the concept Vitruvius talks about. Now, we kind of know that illustration, that a man should fit in the proportions of a church. You see Francesco de Giorgio's drawings of it on the left, sort of stick figures. Giacomo Andrea on the right, another friend, an architect, all on the trip. They're all doing this together. Wonderful dinner party in July 1492 when they get back. We know it from the notebooks at Giacomo Andrea's house. And we know it because Salai, the young boyfriend, breaks one of the plates, spills some red wine, and apparently steals one of the pieces of silverware, thus <laughs> getting the name The Little Devil. And you can imagine them all trying to get the proportions of the human into the cosmos right while not getting spilled upon by Salai until Leonardo does it. And he can tell the difference. A work of absolute anatomical exactitude mixed with unnecessary total beauty. And there it is, a work that symbolizes the connection of art and science and the connection of us to our world and how we fit in it. And if you look carefully at the absolutely beautiful face and body and flash back a moment to this and many other things, we realize that here Leonardo is doing a self-portrait of himself, <laughs> naked in the world and in the cosmos, saying this is how we fit in. And so Leonardo becomes not just an artist, but somebody who uses the great visual displays of information to convey uh, both art and science. It culminates in some of his art pieces. In The Last Supper, for example, we see his theater work. I mean, normally a table's not quite tilted that way, but imagine it being on stage in a castle. You tilt it a bit so you can see what's on it. The lines of perspective go back a little bit too fast. They recede too fast. Well, it's a trick of perspective to make it look deeper. Imagine a stage where the scenery that a Leonardo would paint would be put at an angle, just like those things. And thirdly, it's not a scene of a moment. Kenneth Clark, the great art critic, criticizes it, saying it feels frozen in time. To me, it does not feel frozen in time. The monks walk in, they see Jesus' hand. There's a, him saying, one of you shall betray me. It becomes a dramatic narrative. The apostles, the groups of three right next to him, they're already reacting, saying, is it me, Lord? The sound is just getting out to the apostles on the end, trying to figure out what he's talking about. And the sound even reverberates back, if you look at it. And Jesus is reaching towards the bread and the wine for the institution of the Eucharist, which comes a few passages later in the Gospels. So here we see in one picture both dramatic narrative, the connection of people's emotions to their gestures and motions, and we also see the tricks of perspective. And even the way he put it in this room, you see that window on the left? When you go see it, something struck me. There's the window, and it faces so that right around lunchtime when people will be coming in, the light comes in from that window. Now look at the painting. 
You see the light on the wall there? You see all the shadows? It's as if the light in the painting is coming in from that window. This uh, you may have seen. It was here, believe it or not, last week. Salvador Mundi, the only painting by Leonardo of the 15 finished paintings that he has in private hands. Christie's brought it here. It was just authenticated uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago as being actually the original because there are many copies. We didn't know which was the original, but through many methods that Christie's will explain to you if you want to buy it, it's been authenticated that this is the Leonardo. It's going to go for sale at a hundred million dollar minimum on November 15th in auction. I assume it'll get about 150 million. I will say that probably people you know who spent that much on a sailboat or something, they should buy this painting. It'll be the, and they should give it to the San Francisco Museum of Art for permanent display. <laughs> Very interesting things though. You see the perspective in which Leonardo believes we blur lines in reality, that there aren't sharp lines. Unlike Michelangelo and others, he doesn't do sharp lines. But the right hand, blessing, is actually much sharper than any other thing. People say, that wasn't, he didn't paint that way. But he was doing visual acuity perspective, he called it. The perspective of when something looks distant and at a certain point, it's the sharpest, when it's about this far from your eye. And he does it that way because it makes a hand look like it's actually moving to you. It's coming out. It's three-dimensional. It's coming out of the panel to you. And then there's a confusing thing. I've been in a lot of the newspaper articles about this recently, and I've tried not to stir up the controversy. But in my book, I notice and write a bit about, and nobody had before, the crystal orb. The thing about that crystal orb with the three tiny dots, it's perfectly scientifically right, except for one thing. If you imagine, I'll pick it here, a solid piece of art, and you look at a finger behind it, or you look at clothing behind it, do this at home, it distorts. It makes it invert sometimes. You sort of see a reversal. Christ's robes are not distorted in the least. Uh, why is that? Could be Leonardo just didn't know. No, no. I've read his notebooks. He's doing the optics experiments. He's doing concave measures. He's doing how light refracts. He's doing how mirrors. He knew. Second explanation is he knew, but it would be too distracting, and he didn't want the painting to look ugly, so he kind of fakes it, even as he does with The Last Supper. Probably the right explanation, but an even more appealing explanation is he knew, he knew only a few viewers would actually catch it, but he's trying to show the miraculous and undistorted nature of Christ's shepherdship of our world as Salvador Mundi, and so he's trying to show it's a miracle. I will skip over this because it's about his feud with uh, Michelangelo because I do want to get to the discussion period. But among the things he does is in the flow of um, fluids, he realizes that that's how our blood flows and that's how our heart valves open and shut. It's not because of the pressure as people thought, it's because the swirl brings a membrane out. And he has many, many pages describing it, including the experiments he does to prove it. It was actually just fully proven about 20 years ago with MRI type of uh, imaging. Uh, but what I love about it is on the last pages of his heart thing, his mind is starting to wander. So there he draws the heart one more time and he's doing something, but he pauses and he draws salai around the heart, a very human bit of distraction. Uh, always caring about how water flows into the bowl, and it culminates with this, and I'll sort of make this the last of the pictures. He does optics experiments to figure out that at the center of the eye, in the retina, is exactly the cones that see detail. Near the edges of the retina is where we see shadows and shapes, so he understands the science of how we look at an object. He also dissects the human uh, mouth and smile to show in 14 pages every muscle and nerve that controls the smile. And here on the final page, if you look closely at the very top, he takes up a different, not a pen, but a little piece of chalk and starts in 1503 to draw what will become the most famous smile ever. If you look at that smile, 
If you look at the picture, you see once again, from the eons of past time to the rivers winding, connecting to the civilization of the roads and then into our bodies, it is the connection of humans to our nature. You also look at that smile and you see the culmination of all of science, the exact right of how the muscles of the lips work and how they move. But at the very edge of the smile, if you look directly at it, there are a couple of little details that make it point down slightly, as if not smiling. And that's because if you look at it, he knew directly, it wouldn't look like she's smiling that much. But then, if your eyes go to her forehead or her cheek or her chin, the part of the retina catching her lips is sort of on the corners of your retina, and the shadows make the smile, and the colors make the smile pop on. So it's an interactive, virtual reality smile. Started in 1503 and at his deathbed in 1519, he still got it by his side. Still perfecting that smile, not giving it to the cloth merchant who commissioned it, but making it so that all of his science and all of his anatomy and all of his feelings about mathematics and everything else are combined in this painting to give it an elusive smile that is mysterious that flickers on and off the less you look for it. And that is why I think that those who say that his anatomy and science and everything else was time wasted, I think that smile answers us. He dies in France, his very last notebook page. As he's dying, he's old. He's still trying to square the circle. Still trying, okay, Euclid said if we have a right triangle and we vary the size of the legs, and we do, he does a chart, and the very last line, it says, you know, here's how I've been trying, and then he says, but the soup is getting cold. <laughs> and we can imagine Maturin, his cook, downstairs with Melty and Salai and all of his students and everybody waiting for him, even though he knows he's never going to do it, he's still trying to square the circle, but the soup is getting cold. Thank you all very much. I, I love how Da Vinci would fit in perfectly in San Francisco today. Oh, man. Uh, I can see him. Yeah, you know, it's not quite the Arno, but I can see him in the purple tunics, the entourage. Flamboyant. Flamboyant. He, he's probably into a lot of hipster food. Yeah. Yeah, he was. He was a vegetarian, but there's always that wonderful aura of mystery because we have his shopping list, and he loves buying eel, which... Uh, if you look at The Last Supper, they finally restored it. It's eel with citrus. Now, I don't know which of the restaurants around here do that, but I hope they do. <laughs> I, I want to start with uh, a little bit more about about him, given that he seemed a man ahead of his time, uh, how was he viewed by his contemporaries? Well, he was totally beloved. I mean, he was one of the friendliest, most collegial people, unlike uh, Michelangelo, who was reclusive and kind of nasty and uh, dressed only in black and slept in his own boots, you know. Uh, whereas Leonardo, everybody loves him. He's known for being both the most amazing artist and for screwing up and not finishing some of his paintings. Uh, the people who commission him try to write into the contracts, you know, if you don't finish it, you're going to have to pay us for all the paint, you, you know, that sort of thing. But he was, when he's doing The Last Supper, this is a good example, people would come and sit there in the refectory. The public would, because they knew Leonardo would be there to paint. And they would just watch, and he'd blow in, and he'd do a few strokes, and look at it, and then leave somewhat dramatically. So he was known at the time as a great engineer and painter. How would he see himself, though, amidst all of this? Because right. he had so many deep dives into science and engineering, but it's still... The real question is, was, I mean, he was called the engineer and artist to the Duke, and then engineer and artist to the French King. And people say, did, would he consider himself an engineer or an artist? And... The highfalutin answer is he would not have made a distinction between the two. Both are beautiful brush strokes that convey the glories of creation. Uh, and he wanted to be known as both. 
So you paint this picture of a kind of a quirky fellow when you go mm-hmm. through the book, um, and one that's imperfect, which kind of goes against some of your other stories of some of, uh, some yeah. of the individuals you, you've uh, documented. How, how does that fit into this larger narrative of a genius that kind of doesn't always follow through on his promises? That is such a good question, because halfway through, I mean, I worked on this book for years and Gathering String, and halfway through, I'm like, wait a minute. The guy was a screw-off half the time. He procrastinated. He didn't finish some things. He failed. You know, the machines that never, you know, rolled and the uh, flying machines that never flew and the river that's never diverted. And And I'm thinking, okay, that diminishes him. And then I realized, A, he was pushing for perfection and that there were times he just wouldn't just let let the perfect be the enemy of the good. He wouldn't just churn it out if it wasn't perfect. But more importantly, I realized how human he was, that he was somebody we can really learn from because unlike, say, Einstein, who had this, you know, you and I never, even you, are never going to figure out the tensor calculus of general relativity and improve on it. Please don't ask me any questions about (laughs) tensor calculus. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, But... Leonardo was somebody we can relate to because it came from a childlike curiosity, a sense of observation, fantasizing half the time, but then blurring the line between reality and fantasy. And so I think his flaws actually make him more human. What also struck me as amazing is this is the 15th century, but you have so many primary source material, all these notebooks. Oh, I, I think it. people will know more about da Vinci than me from a right. record. How is all of this material? You said 7,000 pages. In well, you know, when so I well was preserved. doing um, Steve Jobs, I wanted to get some of the things he had done in the 1990s when he was working for Next Computer, something you and I are the only two people who remember what that was. but. Uh, between the stents at Apple. And he's there in his house near, you know, in Cupertino, and I mean, uh, in um, uh, Palo Alto. And he's got a next machine, and he's got two technicians, and they're trying to get the memos and the emails. But the operating system, they can't, you know, it just, they cannot retrieve it. Paper is an absolutely wonderful technology for the storage of information, the retrieval of information. You don't have to worry about Leonardo's operating system in his notebooks not being compatible (laughs) with, you know, Windows XP or something. Uh, And so we have all of this. And there's many lessons in the book. The last chapter is sort of some lessons I've drawn. But one of them is pretty simple, which is take notes on paper (laughs) every day and put them in notebooks. Because 500 years after he did it, we can still play with those notebooks and be amazed at least 50 years from now, your grandchildren will be able to look at your writings on paper, unlike your tweets and Facebook posts and MySpace and all that stuff. I hope no one looks at my Snapchats and all. <laughs> They'll be gone. Wait, but wasn't paper at the time also kind of a somewhat precious resource? Yeah, it was, it was somewhat precious. They just invent. I mean, sometimes you have to have multiple inventions that happen all at once to have a San Francisco in the 1970s or Florence in the 1470s. At that time, you have the printing press. The year he was born, Gutenberg starts printing books. So in his notebook, we have from Leonardo, get the copy, the translation of Euclid that's at the store by the bridge. All these, he's just collecting 400, 450 books by the end of his notebooks. He also, they've invented something called rag paper. They've been able to take rags because they're cloth merchants in Venice, and you know, they're in that business and they have a lot of leftover cloth and suddenly they're making better paper. Uh, They invent uh, debit and credit bookkeeping so the Medici's become rich. All these things have to happen at once. It's like in the Valley, inventing venture capital the same time you're inventing the microchip, the internet, and dropping acid. It all kind of comes together, (laughs) Uh, at least for Steve Jobs it did. So paper was somewhat valuable, and that's why it's really cool that each page, he's cramming as much as possible on it. I showed you one of the notebook pages. And so it's not like this page will just be on water flow. He'll do water flow, but he'll do his craggy man. He'll do people sitting at a table as a study for a painting. And so you see his mind, how his mind leaps around simply because he's trying to cram it all on one page of the paper. And it happens 
with rhyme, if not with reason, if you know what I mean. You, you can sort of see, okay, here's a mental leap, and it's not exactly like he was drawing these triangles and then drew mountains, but they kind of rhyme. Before I had read the book, I had this impression that he was prolific, which you, you definitely indicate he was incredibly prolific. But I had this notion that all of those drawings that we saw became reality, which you quickly mm. disabused me of uh, in going through the book. A lot of this was just conception. And yeah, a lot he of was stuff better he at the conception work. than the reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as Steve Jobs once said, vision without execution is hallucination. But, uh, is that for, the LSD talking again? Yeah. <laughs> but for Leonardo, maybe because he was rejecting being a notary, I don't know, but executing everything perfectly, once he got the conception right, mm -hmm. he was cool. And it was like, all right, I don't need to execute all of these things. So there are weapons that took centuries before people could actually build them. But that's another lesson from Leonardo, which is sometimes, just like you're a kid, let your imagination take hold, fantasize about things that may or may not work. At least it'll make you ahead of your time. That's hard parenting advice. Yeah, <laughs> when I think about my six, learn to procrastinate, learn to imagine, learn to daydream, learn to f indulge fantasy and mystery, and take notes on paper, and be curious. Uh, I want to talk about the masterpiece. I want to talk about the smile, uh, in particular. Uh, you make no equivocations that the Mona Lisa is one of the greatest mm. pieces of art ever conceived. Uh, but then you go into... I think you might say the greatest. The greatest. Yeah. And it, it took a long time for it to be, for it to be painted. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you gave us a hint earlier, but I'd love to dive even deeper onto how much detail he went into, particularly about the cadavers, which is... Yeah. As I said, that smile and the whole painting, he starts in 1503. And as with Ginevra da Benci, the one I showed you at the beginning when he's a young painter, it's for a cloth merchant, middle-class cloth merchant's wife. And the richest people in Italy, Isabella d'Este saying, do my portrait, I'll pay you. No, he doesn't dance to the music of patrons. He does what he wants to do, another lesson. And he never delivers it to a cloth merchant. At his deathbed there, you know, by his bed, and still got four paintings, one of which is the Mona Lisa. He's carried it by pack mule across the Alps and all over Italy because he knows there's always brush strokes that can perfect it. And he's using oil glaze with the tiniest amounts of pigment so that it's hundreds of layers of very thin brush strokes, so thin and tiny that even with our greatest scientific instruments, we can't see each brush stroke separately. I mean, it's just so blended and so perfect together. And the science of it is particularly interesting. I told you about the anatomy of the smile, but he starts with a white primacode on, I think, poplar is the wood he uses. And he knows that by adding layer after layer of paint, that the light will go through each layer and hit the small amounts of pigment in each layer. And so some of the light will be reflected right from the surface back to your eye, and some will be reflected from 30 layers down back to your eye. And he's using slightly different uh, iron oxide to get the shadow browns right. And some will go all the way to the primer coat and bounce back. So it looks like the light is coming from inside of her. Trust me, this is a huge leap in art. And then he dissects, as I say, 30 cadavers to make sure he knows every muscle and every nerve that touches every muscle in the face and whether the nerve comes from the brain or the spinal cord. Is, is he drawing upon anatomy from that time? Was there a medical school? Is he drawing no, no. Upon? He's, he's doing, uh, doing his own cadavers in the basement of uh, both the hospital in Florence and then in um, Milan. And I mean, I wish I had more of the pages, but among the things he's able to do, because there are anatomists of the time, but dissections were frowned upon. It was just becoming tolerated then, too. He does beautiful anatomy drawings, uh, you know, like this one, for example. This is not of the face, but it's obviously of the fetus in the womb. 
This is something that did not happen until Leonardo decided, I'm going to do a lot of anatomy drawings. And was that sort of just beyond the fact that it was, it was groundbreaking at the time, did people receive it well? Because this seems to cross certain lines. Well, it does. And at one point in Rome, he's turned into the authorities uh, and he has to stop doing dis uh, dissections. The church had so many different, like the church often does, mixed emotions about various things. And in Rome, it was worse than it was in Milan. And so he gets in trouble when he's doing it there. But he does it. I mean, uh, he's Leonardo. He's not going to stop being curious. How much of, um, how, we have so much information about him through these notebooks. Mm -hmm. Are there many mysteries that remain about da Vinci? Oh, the great thing is you have to embrace mystery, which is the last lesson I have in my final chapter, because so much about him is mysterious. And even as he blurs the lines, like right there, or if you look at the difference between a Michelangelo painting and a Leonardo painting, Michelangelo on the left, sharp delineated lines, which is unlike the way we see the world, Leonardo having the blurred distinction. But from the exact place of his birth, which I discuss on the first pages of the book, to whether or not he truly died in the arms of the King of France, which I discuss in the last pages of the book, there's always a little mystery on the edges with Leonardo. Mm. Uh, so much of your biographies that you've written, when you've talked about them, you're a sort of a part of the story about how mm -hmm. these people, their stories have impacted you. So how has spending seven years doing all of this research on da Vinci, how has it impacted you beyond the fact that you clearly have a second career as an art critic now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one example. As we go through our day, you may be a little bit like me. You're walking towards the front door of the Commonwealth Club, and you pull out your iPhone, and you check this and that and the other. I have now done like Leonardo instructs us to do and does by example. I try to pause for maybe five seconds, 10 seconds, sometimes a whole minute, to observe things that we just take for granted. I got out of the cab at the corner, walked around, had never seen the new building, the salt air suddenly hits me. I go, wow. So I look, and I look at the water, and I look at the tiniest of the white caps, and I tried to figure out how do the ripples come across, and why do the ripples not go in the exact direction of the wind? Why? Because Leonardo and Ben Franklin, both in their notebooks, wonder how do ripples form on the surface of water. Because Leonardo, when he did the River Jordan going past the ankles of Jesus, in that painting, gets the ripples right. Pausing for just a moment to think about why does water, why did light glint on the leaf, a curved leaf, and I see a sparkle. What was it? The sunlight hit something shiny. How did it get to my eye? These are the things that kids notice and that we don't, and we're sometimes too distracted, too busy, too whatever, to just pause and notice something. So it's not that it comes naturally to me. It may not even come naturally to Leonardo, but I push myself to say, wait a minute, look at that water, look at the ripples. So you believe that's a, a learned element? That totally. Leonardo's, a, yeah, look, I did it just now. I looked <laughs> when I came in, I looked at that water, I said, look at the ripples. How would I depict them? How are they like sound waves? Leonardo asked that question too. Do they bounce back when they hit an object? You know, there's Leonardo drawings near the end of, there, right there, water flowing into a pond. How does it cause a swirl? What's it like when water flows past an object? Why does it look curly the way it does? This is not, as I said, tensor calculus. You and I can do this. I remember in, in college, one of my physics professors, as he would pour half and half into his coffee, would remark about how that was the best uh, tangible example of chaos theory that he's ever seen in his life. Actually, entropy, <laughs> if you ever want to know why the arrow of time actually goes forward, is because your half and half will never unstir from the coffee mm -hmm. because basically the arrow of entropy and of uh, chaos 
I, I ask about whether this and Leonardo knew that too. He knew the flow of water was like the flow of time, mm -hmm. and that every instant was not a single instant, but connected to the moment before and the moment afterwards. And so I think even noting the passage of time, the way Einstein, Leonardo did. It's sort of amazing because you, you, he's clearly this larger than life, flamboyant, very vain character. And at the same time, you ascribe to him these fairly incredibly philosophical moments um, as well. I, I ask about whether that can be learned is because there is this notion, at least when I was growing up, that genius is innate. That yeah. th there's something really special about these people that you've chronicled. And while certainly you, you emphasize that, um, that there is something special about Ben Franklin and Steve Jobs and, and Da Vinci, you don't make them larger than life characters. That yeah, because it outlier. is not true. There's certain things that are innate. Most things are a mixture of being innate and you know, heritage and breeding and uh, interacting with our environment. But as I said, what might be innate might be a certain type of intelligence. But those intelligent people don't often amount to much. Mm -hmm. What really causes it is, as I said, imagination, mm -hmm. creativity. That is not innate. That is something we may have as a kid, and we either have it beaten out of us by our teachers and parents, or we nurture it. But Leonardo... And Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin wasn't the smartest of the founders. I mean, Jefferson, Madison, he wasn't the most passionate. I mean, John Adams, his cousin Samuel. But he was the one who tied things together and was open to, as I ride up and down doing the postal service, why do these whirlwinds happen and does that help explain the Gulf Stream? And even tying that to his statecraft. So those are things that are not people born with a superhuman processing power that we can't ever try to emulate. Ben Franklin and Leonardo, the reason I wrote Leonardo was to refute that thing you keep being told, which is, don't worry, you can't ever be like that. You had to be born that way. No, Leonardo made himself that way, starting as a little kid, the rivers going into the Arno. So I want to go back to something you said at the beginning, Smart people are a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. It's the creative people that matter. Mm -hmm. If it's the creative people that matter, how do we as a society nurture that? I mean, Well, first many of all, we quit siloing things, telling you here's the different discipline. You've got to study engineering or math, and that's different from art or music or whatever. We have to say get out of those disciplines at universities and school kids and even us and mm -hmm. you know, people working in the outside that window. I can probably see them. Mm -hmm. They get siloed and their knowledge and say, no, love the beauty of everything. And this is always gets applause, I mean, not applause, but you know, people say, yeah, I agree with you when I talk about how we can't just be only engineers and mathematicians, it's those who connect art and creativity mm -hmm. that'll do it. But what I also say is if you're somebody who loves art and music and plays, you'd be uh, appalled if somebody said, I don't know the difference between Shakespeare and uh, you know, Stoppard, or between Macbeth and Hamlet, or I don't like music or whatever. And yet people like that, people like my friends, they would happily, merrily admit, even joke or brag, that they don't know the difference between, say, a transistor and a resistor. They don't know how logic is done through on-off switches on a circuit. They don't know the difference between an integral and a differential equation. And they say, oh, I just don't do math. Oh, I don't do engineering. Well, you know, humanists and people who love the arts have got to also go to the intersection, not just claim that the engineer should come to their part of the intersection. The intersection uh, has always felt like an empty intersection at times. It's, it's occupied by, by few people. Do you right, feel like the there's room to crowd that intersection with so many more now? Oh, yeah, I think uh, Steve Jobs is one of the great examples, but the ultimate creative people are those who, in college or before they drop out, study calligraphy and dance and music as also uh, electronics. And uh, you, uh, I can find within these zip codes people from Ev Williams to Jeff Bezos to Elon Musk to uh, who love storytelling, love music, love space travel, love... 
uh, you know, business models. And the more wide-ranging their curiosity, the more likely they are to be creative. You end the book with many lessons that you feel like you walked away with personally. They're not prescriptive. There's just sort of, mm -hmm. uh, there's, they're items. Uh, are there any that you want to share that really most impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I've talked about some, which is retain your childlike sense of curiosity. Um, you mentioned, mm -hmm. we were talking once, uh, can I do the woodpecker? Oh, yeah. One of my favorite um, points of, of the book a favorite um, is you mention uh, and you highlight in the notebook, there is a, uh, in one of his notes, there is just a random question about how does Describe the tongue go of, of a woodpecker. woodpecker. And without like any context, sky, right? No, it's like, uh, the context is like 15 other questions, like, why do people yawn? Explain whether the muscles that do the eyebrow are the same that wrinkle the nose. You know, why is the sky blue? Describe the tongue of a woodpecker. So that's when I do a double take, right? <laughs> I say, wait a minute, this guy's really going out. I mean, there's no use, use for that, not, you know, whatever. It's not like you need it to do a flight of birds, uh, whatever. How would you wake up one morning and decide you need to know what the tongue of a woodpecker looks like? And people kind of, you know, I make fun of it. And I'd say, how would you even know? I mean, what do you do, grab a woodpecker and open his mouth? And so I skipped by, not being like Leonardo, not having learned from Leonardo. I just sort of jokingly, I, it's in the introduction of the book. I write it and sort of joke about just what I just said. And then I'll run into it a few more times. And later in the book, I'm trying to figure out friction and stuff and muscles and how they move. And finally, I say to myself, wait, I'm not being like Leonardo. I ought to go figure out what the tongue of the woodpecker looks like. Now, the tongue of the woodpecker is three times as long as the beak. It wraps around the brain when it retracts, so that when the pecker hits the bark at 10 times what would kill a human, it cushions the brain. There is no reason you need to know that. <laughs> it is useless information. But the last two paragraphs of my book, I describe it to you on the theory that, like Leonardo, who put that in his notebook, you just might want to know, out of curiosity, pure curiosity. <laughs> I, I loved it, because I actually, when I first got to it, I looked it up myself. Yeah, because I you're was like, curious. Because yeah. I was, I don't know how a woodpecker mm -hmm. tongue works. Uh, take us into um, the process of doing this. Um, we're talking about 600 years of history that you had to delve through in 7,000 pages of notebooks. What was it like to delve into this? this well, story? you know, it was tough, you know, a dirty job. Somebody had to do it to go see the notebooks. I mean, it means you have to go to Venice and Florence and tough Paris game. and mm -hmm. London and um, Windsor Castle and mm -hmm. Madrid and Seattle. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it was a journey of joy to just go from place to place. Nobody's ever fully compiled these notebooks, which is kind of cool. It means you have to go to the Bibliotheque Ambrosiana and, um, you know, see the codex on the flight of birds. Here, grab my book. Let me borrow it for half a second. We get the book, my little author picture. If you look at it carefully, it's in the Academy in Venice. We're on the fourth floor in a closet, not on display, is Vitruvian Man. They just keep it in a gray folder because they can't be exposed to light too much. And I go with my wife, and I know somebody in Italy is helping me, my translator, and we talk our way into saying, open up the closet, show it to me. And there I get to sit there looking, noticing how incisive he does the line right there. How right there in the navel he puts a protractor point. And you get a tingle up your spine. You're actually in the presence of the hand of the master. So that's how difficult it was to do all this research. <laughs> <laughs> very uh, difficult and overwhelming. But you weren't the first to write a biography of da Vinci. You won't be the last either. But you yeah. must have seen something that was missing from some of those well, previous stories. Well, the there are great biographies of Leonardo. 
more importantly, great books about them that aren't really biographies in the sense that they're not chronological life stories, mm -hmm. but they're about his art or whatever. Martin Kemp, who helped me quite a bit, a Don at Oxford, has a couple of books analyzing Leonardo da Vinci, and I think they're great. And he has a new book out analyzing the background of the painting of the Mona Lisa, meaning the families involved, that sort of thing. Uh, so you get to meet all sorts of people, and I hope, like a good, you know, person, I try to be collaborative, and even when we talked about Leonardo's mother, you know, Martin Kemp is in there by name as mm -hmm. the person who had discovered exactly this about his mother. So it's fun working with people who have worked on Leonardo. But you look at the greatest books about Leonardo, such as Kenneth Clark, I can't remember when it was, but it was like 50, 60, 70 years ago. Kenneth Clark is an art connoisseur. He's the one I told you is just brilliant in his connoisseurship of the paintings, but he's the one who said he wasted all this time doing math and geology and anatomy. What a shame he could have painted more pictures. Mm -hmm. So I come, of it, come at this book, unlike others who've written about Leonardo, they usually base their books on the 12 or so great masterpieces of painting. Mm -hmm. I base my book on the notebooks mm -hmm. and what he was doing every day and the connections he made between art and science and engineering and spirituality that you can only get as you look at those pages crammed with many things on it. And so I think, unlike other books about Leonardo, mm -hmm. this is a narrative biography that starts with him being born, ends on that deathbed, but does it being as its foundation uh, the notes that Leonardo took. So everyone wants to know. I have a stack of questions here saying, what's next? What's your next book? They're already ready for what's next. <laughs> but but uh, rather than ask that, I want, I want to know, how has this sort of series of biographies impacted what you're looking for in terms of telling the next story? Because yeah. I, I think it's, it's easy to look on the surface and see that you're telling a story of genius, but it seems much more than that. When right. It's a story of how we can all be more like the great geniuses. Mm -hmm. It's a study about creativity, what it is, how you achieve it. And I didn't, Leonardo's great at noticing patterns. I wasn't. I had done Ben Franklin, and then, oh, that led me to Einstein, and then Steve Jobs said, do me next. I said, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> um, Easiest yes yeah, ever. Yeah, um, and it was only then I started noticing the pattern, which is people who are interested in the widest variety of things tend to see the patterns of nature in ways that make them more creative than most other people. And so that is the theme. And I must say, for better or worse, this is the culmination. I mean, you don't get greater. I mean, I decided to do Leonardo da Vinci because he was the most creative. He was the person most curious about everything you could possibly know, about everything that could be known about the universe, including how we fit in. So it's not like then you go on to the even greater person. I knew that at the end of all these biographies would come the greatest of them all, Leonardo da Vinci. So I don't plan to do another creative genius biography book. I plan to move back to my hometown of New Orleans I probably will write a book about race and sex and jazz in the 1890s in Storyville in New Orleans and before we drew the color line. Uh, but it won't be, it'll be a smaller book with an audience of people who love jazz New Orleans and worry about race. I, I will put in my vote. I think it would be fascinating for you to tell a story about the geography of a place informing and the, the geography of, of genius and creativity is like Florence in 1470 mm -hmm. the Bay Area in 1970 or till today in which when you get a diverse group of people I mean just take jazz for example you have to have people coming back from the Spanish American War hawking their cornets and you have to have the drummers for freed slaves in Congo Square doing their rhythms from Africa you have to have the Creole John de Couleur you know octoroons and quadroons with their Creole Foxtrot orchestras, and you have to have uh, the spirituals of the people from the plantations coming down, and the blues, and the sanctified church, and you have to have a place that's enormously tolerant of all of that, and then jazz is born. I believe strongly in the geography of creativity. 
Wow, I didn't understand half the terms you just threw out there, but I can tell you, it's the best advertisement for visiting New Orleans ever. Yeah, um, it also works on the food if you're not into the jazz. <laughs> the cuisine comes the same way. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we've reached our last question, and, uh, and it, it's quite simply, it's been 500 plus years since Da Vinci um, uh, passed away, and he's had numerous impacts on our society. Do you think his legacy going forward is going to be the same as it's been. Is he going to still be relevant? As yeah, I think forward? we're seeing actually an increase in the relevance mm -hmm. of Leonardo da Vinci. Because for a very long time, starting with Einstein in a way and C.P. Snow or whatever, you had the great divide of the two cultures, meaning those who love science and those who love the humanities and art. Now I say Einstein because he loved both, Mozart, Mm -hmm. and music and math and everything else. But Einstein made it difficult. The average Ben Franklin could understand Newton. You know, action, reaction, force, mass. You know, the laws of Newton were things, a normal... Pr Einstein made it seem like you had to be a total genius to understand science, and people either loved science because of him, or they were intimidated because of him. So you have the two cultures split. And that lasts for most of the 20th century. My father was an engineer, a scientist, my grandfather and stuff, but I was more of a humanist. And so I realized how that split had occurred. It is because of this area and this period that now the merger of engineering and beauty, the notion that beauty matters but also circuit uh, and uh, software matters, and that those have to be done jointly. The people who worry about artificial intelligence putting us out of jobs, there's a long tradition mainly in this area, starting with Doug Engelbart, Alan Kay, Steve Jobs, which is that the combination of human creativity and uh, process, uh, microchip processing power combined will always increase faster than the productivity of humans alone or of machines alone. So if you want to not worry about artificial intelligence and robots replacing us, you have to say, yes, if we have the partnership of creativity of humans as well as the processing power of microchips, that will increase faster. That is making, I'm sorry about the long answer here, but that makes Leonardo all the more relevant. The people who can find the beauty in engineering, in the pa patterns of nature, mm -hmm. but also understand the simplest thing that is true of Einstein, Steve Jobs, and mainly Leonardo, the simplest lesson, beauty matters. Mm. Please join me in uh, thanking Walter Isaacson. And thank you. I'd, I'd like to remind everyone that copies of Walter's books are available for sale outside, and he'll be happy to sign yours. We do appreciate you uh, letting, letting him make his way to the signing table first. And I'm Kishore Hari. Thank you for joining us here at the brand new Commonwealth Club. Thank you.